lecture number three, Charlotte Temple. Action. I'm not ready. All right, we've got the hat, Uncle Tom. It is hat it is. Fan the paper. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? What are you listening to? All right, I think I'm ready. No, I'm not ready. Gotta calm down. Hello, everybody, and welcome to English 332. I am your host, Professor Matt Cohen, and this, my friends, is the birth of the American novel. Welcome back. We're having a good time today with our first novel, Charlotte Temple by Susanna Rosen. Did I pronounce it right? Charlotte Temple. Uh, I want to point out before I get started, if you take a look at that first slide, um, our lecture today is titled Charlotte Temple, Picturesque Seduction or Virtue Porn? Man. I didn't tell you about that, did I, Dan? No. Yeah. It's an exciting one. Uh, and on there you will see my office hours as well. Like I said, reach out, get in touch with me. Looking forward to meeting everybody. Charlotte Temple. Charlotte Temple clearly fits the provisional definition of a novel that we laid out last time in that lecture. A long fictional narrative in prose. Uh, this was written by an English woman, as I said, uh, Susanna Rosen, she emigrated to America uh, after a while. She wised up and moved to Philadelphia. It's a great city. My brother used to live there, actually. It's never been the same. We're going to talk about Philadelphia a little bit more later in the semester. Um, we are we're used to novels. It's very hard to imagine a world without novels. And it's hard to believe that there was a time once when basically no one wrote novels. Um, it's easy to imagine pop stars coming and going. Donovan? Anyone? You guys are keeping Madonna alive, right? How about the Bangles? Everybody remember the Bangles? First show I ever saw. The Bangles. The Love It Auditorium downtown. You didn't go to that one, did you? No, my first show was Weird Al Yankovic. There you go. It's easy to imagine pop stars coming and going. He's actually still out there touring. He is. Well, the same thing happens on a huge scale to entire categories of literature. They come and go. And I think we learned something about thinking about why that happens. Charlotte Temple's a little window onto the rise of the novel. Consider, for starters, that at the time that Rosen published her novel, there weren't even really publishers as we know them today. Oh, take a look at that next slide. There's a, an image of Rosen from her time. You see her wearing the pearls and stuff, right? Very, uh, uh, an attempt to make her kind of a high class looking uh, author. We'll, we'll talk about why that is in a second. And then look at the next slide, and you'll see uh, in slide number three pictures of the title page um, of a copy of her book from 1794. Um, now, on the left there, and then on the right, a serialized version of the novel that comes later on in the century, uh, that's in, uh, or the next century, 1877, that was published. Uh, but look at, if you look down at the bottom of that title page on the left, you'll see it doesn't list a publisher. It just says, printed for M. Carey, that stands for Matthew Carey, a bookseller, and then it lists his shop's address there on Market Street at the end. Um, at the end of the 18th century, that is the end of the 1700s, England, along with its colonies, was completely transformed uh, economically, politically, and socially. It became the world's first real industrial economy, and at the same time, the world's first leading political and military power, as they used to say, the sun never sets on the British Empire. But it also experienced the first successful colonial revolution. That's right, that was us. No aspect of British or British American life was unaffected by all these changes that were happening, and that included the book trade. There were specific changes within the, within the trade. There were some technological advances in printer ma print, uh, paper making and in printing, and there was an expansion of book production and book selling both beyond just London, beyond a big city. There were changes in copyright law that made it a little bit easier for authors to claim their ownership. But there were also wider developments. There was wild population growth. There were increased literacy rates. There was a greater demand for printed stuff of all kinds. And that enabled some of the more enterprising spirits in the trade to change their businesses. Some book vendors became more specialized, for example, since there was so much more selling and printing going on. And they tried to just try, started to try wholesale models um, where you would kind of act as a distributor rather than being both the printer and the distributor or the person who funded the 
book and also at the bookseller. Not until that time did publishing, the organization, the management, the financing, and the publication of new books, not until then did publishing become a separate and a distinctive activity. So Matthew Carey, who published Charlotte Temple, among many other books, he was one of the first large-scale book operators. And even then, you don't see him, like you see, you don't see him listed as a publisher in those terms, not until long after this book came out. So today I'm going to quickly move through some of the major points that need to be made about the 18th century and the Enlightenment and literature to kind of try to explain where Charlotte Temple is coming from. I'm going to define a million terms, I'm going to describe the literary movement called sentimentalism, which this book is a major part of, and some of the formal features, remember form from the last lecture, one of the four key elements that we're going to be coming back to again and again. Um, if you look at the next slide, I made a wordle of Charlotte Temple. This is a wordle where you, you list the terms, you know, like word cloud, doodad, the terms that are the most frequent in the novel. And when you look at that, um, you can see like the most frequently used uh, words in it, um, as will not surprise you from reading even uh, the little bit that we uh, had to read last week, you can tell it's a very character focused novel. It's named after one of the characters we're constantly rotating around Charlotte and Montreville as we read this book. But I want you to notice also how big the term heart is. It's very frequently used. Also the terms woman, man, child, dear. Sentimentalism, it's all about feelings. It's all about intimate human sympathies. Um, and I'm going to try to explain also, um, as we sort of move forward and think about where this book is coming from, why there were no novels written and published by Americans before the Revolutionary War. Um, and then to round things out at the end, I'm going to offer a perverted reading of this novel that I hope will make it a, even more interesting. It's a novel that seems like it's got a pretty clear takeaway. Kids, especially ladies, obey your parents because that will keep you from perdition. It would be easy to think that that's the only... What the hell's going on out there? Birds. Jeez. It'd be easy to think that that was the only takeaway from this novel. I want to argue it's actually a little bit more interesting than that. It is admittedly a pretty preachy novel, always telling you what to do, but it's also very fast moving. It's governed in part by the very simple main requirement of art, as far as people in the 1700s were concerned. If you look at your next slide, you will see it. As far as they were concerned, art in any medium had the purpose to delight and instruct. It should entertain, that is, be delightful, but it should also have a lesson. It should be instructive, it should have a moral. And in this, it, this shifted the definition of literature. Before this time, in the 1600s, the 1500s, and earlier, literature, that word, referred to almost anything that a person who could read in a language could be expected to tackle. It included law, it included science, it included philosophy and theology, uh, poetry, and, and so on. But with this new idea of art to delight and instruct, and with an increase in the amount of fiction that was being published, of poetry, of other creative writing that was coming out, the definition of literature got narrower. It came to mean ambitious works of imaginative writing that were designed to enrich the mind and to purify the soul. That's a little closer to what we think of as literary writing today, um, although I don't know about enriching our soul. Yeah, maybe maybe that's still kind of something we hope for in, in high literary writing. Now, but this was a new idea at the time. All these new ideas about literature, these changes, caused a bunch of new things to be thought about. People in the 18th century thought a lot about the power of words to change the world, to cause revolutions, to change your heart, to start or end a relationship, to make you depressed, to make you blush, even. What's a blush, after all, right? Am I blushing? I can make you blush. We could, we'll fix it in post. Good. Right? It's a blush. It's a book. You're reading something, right? And yet you have this biological reaction. It's crazy that that can happen. Um, it's a book. A book makes you have a reaction. That's, that's what all authors want. So they thought a lot about how that happened. What, what made it happen? Was it automatic? Was it something that was inborn in you? Or is it something that you could do with art? Is something that art had a special property of being able to make happen. I think Charlotte Temple offers an interesting example of how 18th century people thought about the role of literature in more intimate situations. It is, after all, about controlling your impulses. But let me start 
by laying on you a whole bunch of definitions that help us understand what people in Susanna Rosen's era were concerned with um, that might help explain why the novel Charlotte Temple contains some of the scenes and some of the discussions that it does. Terms. Okay. These three terms we're going to start with um, are, let's see, the picturesque, the beautiful, and the sublime. We're going to talk about a couple of other terms as well, the romantic, the sentimental. These come up over and over again in Charlotte Temple, and you're going to see them actually in the books through the rest of the semester. They had very specific meanings, though, in the late 18th century. By the end of the 18th century, Enlightenment rationalist ideas about art and how it made you feel things were being challenged by looking at the experiences of beauty and sublimity, or kind of being overwhelmed by art, as maybe being non-rational. Maybe they were inborn reactions. Artistic experience, that is to say, how looking at a painting or dance or listening to music or reading managed to make you feel things, um, it did not, these new thinkers suspected, involve merely a rational decision. You didn't just look at a pleasing curved form. Take a look at your next slide there, um, slide number six, the line of beauty. You didn't just look at a pleasing curved form and decide it was beautiful. Rather, that was a natural response, somehow ingrained. Remember, they did not know about genetics back then. So whether you could inherit ideas or attitudes or even skills, that was still kind of a murky question. Maybe that was possible, they thought. The statesman and philosopher Edmund Burke published a book in 1756 called A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful, which offered very influential definitions of these art-feeling terms. These definitions linked basic ideas about what humans could be held responsible for, including ideas of human rights and laws, to how people reacted in the world. Because if it turns out that you have to be taught how to sympathize, you have to be taught how to appreciate art, um, then that's one thing. But if humans were just supposed to be born with those capacities, then that was another thing. If you didn't show the right reactions to art, if you didn't feel sad when something bad happened, if it was inborn, then you didn't have that and you weren't quite human. So big consequences for just simple basic ideas about how people react to art. Every novel, as a result, that is written during this time in some way makes an argument about how art affects humans, or how it ought to affect them, because these debates about whether you needed to learn how to react to art, or whether art simply needed to touch the right inborn chords, these debates were very, very heated. Writers and artists were challenging basic assumptions about what human experience was, even how the human body and mind worked. So the beautiful. This is the mode, that, and you can see this in the line of beauty, this is the mode that involves balance. It involves elegance, perfection, the mastery of art and design in order to please the senses. The so-called line of beauty here expressed this in a single figure. It can be found as part of compositions that try to achieve this standard of beauty. Actually, if you look at the next slide, you'll see a number of those. Um, uh, classical Greek art and architecture was kind of the model for this. They were thought of as embodying this perfect balance and almost mathematical precision of arrangement. Um, also, wow, apparently there's a British TV show called The Line of Beauty, which apparently mostly involves like uh, male beauty, half naked. And I know you can't see this picture, but you really wish you could. So yeah, this idea is still around. Um, I suppose down there in the bottom there's a painting of William Hogarth, who was an artist at the time who very often, um, on one hand, made fun of this idea, but also uh, embraced it in his works. Also there's a cute picture of his dog. The sublime is the opposite of the beautiful, but not in the sense of being ugly. It is the opposite with respect to the powers of your mind that it provokes. So if the mind is brought to ideas uh, of uh, perfection and ideas of uh, moral purity by the beautiful, in the case of the sublime, it's actually the case that, uh, that you're overwhelmed. It makes all appreciation, all rational thought about something impossible, overwhelming you um, with, well, take a look at the next slide. 
boom. There's a painting of the Judgment Day by one of the great painters of the sublime, John Martin. Um, you, you look at this and the idea is that you'll just be kind of blown away by what nature is capable of. Many of us have had sublime experiences where we just see something awful happening and we're just stopped in our tracks and we can't even really think, right? It's not just rubbernecking. It, it, you're actually like, holy, maybe the whole world is changing, right? And, and I have no control over it. That's the sublime. Um, look at this painting. All the cities you created crumbling into dust. Uh, society crashing into the void. Look at all the straight lines, right? There's no line of beauty in here. Strong, unbalanced colors, lightning, earthquakes, volcanoes, climate change. Oops, did I say that? Anyway, you get the idea. The picturesque, our third term we're working on, then you look at that next slide. The picturesque arose as an artful mediation between the extremes of the beautiful and the sublime. It shows the possibility, the, po the possibilities that kind of hover in between these two when you combine those impulses and those uh, reactions that the mind has to looking at a work of art or to reading a work of art. Um, so here's a couple of examples. I just chose examples from visual culture because it's kind of easy to, to see it, um, but we'll look at an example from the novel here in a second. Um, so here, for example, you've got landscape architecture in which uh, you have two different versions of how you might design a landscape. These are both the same estate, right? The estate on the top, um, it's been very cleaned up, right? All of the uh, brush has been moved away. You can see the architecture clearly. You can see a lot of the sky and you can see the whole river. You can see the line of beauty actually in the curve of the river down the middle of this picture. In the second picture, you've got a mixture of light and shade, the natural and the artful, the, the man-made and the nature-made mixed together in a balance. So you're reminded of the natural world, but not overwhelmed by it. You're reminded of man's capacities, but you're not only supposed to be looking uh, at the beautiful, a managed wilderness, if you will, where imperfection is present, but it's balanced by excellence. So if you look in the next slide, here's an example from Charlotte uh, Temple. This is chapter six. This is a moment in which you can see this aesthetic of the beautiful and a hint that it might not be all that it appears. Charlotte Temple is very much into the picturesque. It likes the, the, you, it likes the idea that you would be suspicious of too much beauty or you'd be suspicious of being overwhelmed by your passions. This is one of the most important lines in the text and it's one we'll return to. Uh, she says, in affairs of love, a young heart is never in more danger than when attempted by a handsome young soldier. A man of an indifferent appearance, that is, who's not that attractive, will, when arrayed in a military habit, and that is a costume, show to advantage. But when beauty of person, elegance of manner, and an easy method of paying compliments are united to the scarlet coat, smart cockade, and military sash, ah, oh, well a day for the poor girl who gazes on him, she is in imminent danger. But if she listens to him with pleasure, tis all over with her. And from that moment, she has neither ears, uh, eyes nor ears, for any other object. Beautiful Beauty here is overwhelming and it is pleasing, but it is also dangerous. The picturesque is kind of the main aesthetic mode of Charlotte Temple, in part because this author is trying to convince you of the novel's dependence upon the dark side of things in order to enhance truth. That is to say, if the novel were just about sex and murder, it would only delight. It'd be fun, but it would not instruct you. To defend itself against the charge that it's just empty, lurid trash, which admittedly would be pretty entertaining. The novel insists that you need a little experience of the bad in order to appreciate and to learn how to imitate the good. So that combination of dark and shade, reason and passion, that it wants to convince you is the right path to be on. If you take a look at the next slide, this is a, a moment from chapter four uh, where we'll see the picturesque coming out even more clearly. This is the moment when um, Temple's uh, meeting his future father-in-law and, uh, and just trying to bail him out of debtor's prison then asks him, well, how much is it going to take to get you out? Temple started. It was more than he expected. But something must be done, said he. That sweet maid must not wear out her life in a prison. I will see you again tomorrow, my friend, said he, shaking Eldridge's hand. Keep up your spirits. Light and shade are not more happily blended than are the pleasures and pains of life, and the horrors of the one serve only to increase the splendor of the other. There's your light and shade. And Eldridge bounces him back. You never lost a wife and son, he says. But Temple hangs in there because he really, really loves this guy's daughter. No, replied he, but I can feel for those who have. Eldridge pressed his hand. It worked. Dad's like, okay. And they went toward the door and they parted in silence. 
this moment also speaks then to the question of sympathy, uh, that idea that we can train ourselves, even though we haven't had the experience of others, to connect with them and to put ourselves in their places. And that is a means of making connections where previously they had been thought impossible. The fact that Temple just naturally feels this and says to his future father-in-law, look, I, you know, I haven't had your experience, but I can do this. This shows that he's a good suitor. It shows he's a good match. It shows he's a virtuous person. Look at the next slide. We'll take another uh, description. It was a fine evening in the beginning of autumn. The last remains of daylight faintly streaked the western sky while the moon with pale and virgin luster in the room of gorgeous gold and purple ornamented the canopy of heaven with silver fleecy clouds which now and then half hid her lovely face, half hid her lovely face, and by partly concealing, heightened every beauty. Partial concealment enhances beauty. A hint of things, not complete revelation. The picturesque is, in a word, softcore. There are two other important formal features of Rousen's novel. First, it is didactic fiction. Didactic fiction means that it's teachy, preachy. Um, it's about giving advice. It's about giving guidance. It's sometimes also called prescriptive uh, fiction. It gives you a recipe like a, like a prescription, like your doctor would for, in this case, how not to suck. Um, but the second feature uh, that uh, defines its form and that really determines kind of how this book works is that it is also a seduction tale. Uh, this is uh, one of the most popular genres of the 18th century. The model for it is a massively long book called Clarissa by a guy named Samuel Richardson. This thing is like a thousand pages long, maybe more. I don't know. It's I never got to the end of it. I'm not going to lie. In this novel, um, it, it, and in yeah, most seduction tale, what? Pops, what, he would give the t-shirt. My dad taught this book. It is a thousand pages long to get people through it in the semester. He made t-shirts that he would give out to the students if they actually managed to get all the way through it at the end. Um, so yeah, so I've given you like a hundred page version of this novel, which is a lot shorter. I dig it. These novels share a template. In this kind of novel, the young, often lower middle class, girl in peril is the centerpiece. She is pursued by the usually wealthier, horny man. Yeah. And uh, this just becomes the kind of basic version of the novel in the 18th century. And the question we should ask is why? Why is it that women's virtue was so important? Why do we keep getting this novel written over and over again? And why is this novel obsessed with women's virtue? Here, we have to turn away. Now, we've been talking about formal features here. We have to talk about, about something other than form and style in order to get at this. So we're going to look at that fourth term in our list of four approaches to studying the novel and turn to the context in which this was written. In this case, I think historical lessons are useful for us. So you take a look at the next slide and I introduce a term that's actually important for the most of the books the rest of the semester, actually. Women's virtue was so obsessively the topic of novels at this time because women were crucial in maintaining both patriarchal control and the property system of English culture at this time. For starters, women uh, were subject to a law called coverture. They became uh, covered women, uh, femme couverte, this is the legal term, whenever they married. And by the law of coverture, it, that, uh, they gave up their property, basically. Uh, they were no longer able to make legal transactions involving their property. Only their husbands could do it. So that, on the one hand, takes power away from women. It makes them legal wards of their husbands. And it imagines them as, as helpless. Uh, the, the very act of becoming uh, a, you know, a married woman, a publicly uh, mature person, in fact, legally removed a bunch of your rights. But it's also true that as a result of this system, English people then put women at the center of the generation to generation transmission of wealth and class. Strictly controlling sexuality kept bloodlines and, as a result, inheritance lines clear, and in the process, kept women's tremendous intellectual and social powers located away from politics, from law, from medicine, the church, and for the most part, from high finance. There were, there, you, you could, if your husband died, right, you could regain control of your property. So there were a few widows who had an important economic role, but in many cases, a woman's cho choice of a partner 
just loomed as this huge question, as a, as a massive consequential decision. It became a flashpoint for women's power, in effect, in a legal regime like coverture, making sure your partner is not just a f boy was absolutely key. Um, the novels were a way of outing men's exploitative tactics and also of encouraging both men and women to think beyond wealth and beyond sex when they made that choice about who they were going to marry. I don't know about the <laughs> boy term. What do we call them? Heck boys? Hacking boys? Is that what hacking means? I think hacking means f***ing, doesn't it? Nah. I don't know. There's no hacking way I'm going to figure this out today. So back to the question of this novel's form. Now up to now, I've been calling Charlotte Temple a novel, even though its subtitle calls it a tale of truth. Rosen calls herself a novelist in the introductory note to the book, and this is important. Truth isn't a genre. Truth underlies the narrative rather than being represented by the narrative. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant, is what Emily Dickinson says. It's not a true tale, but a tale of truth. There's a big difference. So, the novel was, if you take a look at your next slide, the novel at this time was thought about um, in negative ways. It was a bad genre. It was wasting time. It was especially dangerous to young ladies um, because instead of doing their household chores, instead of learning how to become a lady, dependent on the class, you'd be reading the novel and fantasizing about somebody else's life. This isn't just about the content of the novel. Is there dirty stuff in it? It's also about bad uses of the imagination, um, as opposed to good ones. This sounds kind of crazy, but if you think about video games, right? Everybody says the same stuff about video games today. Look at this uh, quotation. This is from 1796 in a magazine called Sylph. Uh, one of these critics says, women of every age, of every condition, contract and retain a taste for novels. The depravity is universal. My sight is everywhere offended by these foolish yet dangerous books. I find them on the toilet of fashion, and in the work bag of the seamstress, in the hands of the lady who lounges on the sofa, and of the lady who sits at the counter. I have actually seen mothers in miserable garrets crying for the imaginary distresses of a heroine, while their children were crying for bread. And the mistress of a family losing hours over a novel in the parlor while her maids, in emulation of the example, were similarly employed in the kitchen. This is exactly the kind of stuff they say about video games, right? You're wasting your life, you're wasting your time, it's bringing down Western civilization. Well, these novels sold pretty well. So Rosen's move here in Charlotte Temple is to suggest that the novel, like any technology, can be used for good or for bad. And she's using it for good, that's what she has to convince you. She's doing that by training your emotions and your moral reflexes. So instead of you uh, ignoring your children, you are actually learning how to be better with your children by reading something like Charlotte Temple. That's her argument. At the same time, she's telling an exciting story, which involves, of course, raising your temperature in not-so-moral areas. And that, in turn, means that there are some difficult kinds of management that Rosen has to do in this novel. Some of these have to do with other terms that we're going to need to define, the sympathetic, the sentimental, and the romantic. These terms link the emotional features of the novel to its style and its tone. Learning about these helps us understand how the novel manipulates your emotions, but it also helps us understand how people in the, in the 18th century thought about the connections between emotion and politics or daily life. If a novel could change your emotions, and a politician could appeal to them too, then novels became as potentially powerful as any politician, and maybe more so since in the days before television and the internets, novels could reach many more readers' hearts than most politicians could. No Twitter back then. So in the next slide, you can pull up the next slide, but don't look at it. The first element of this transformation of your emotional life is sympathy. And sympathy was a heavily theorized emotion at this time. And oddly, it was a market analyst, of all people, who wrote one of the most influential books on sympathy in the 18th century. Adam Smith, you may remember him as the author of such books as Wealth of Nations, a uh, financial theorist. Well, right after that book, he wrote another one called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. At the root of the unpredictability of markets, of course, is the unpredictability of human trust and emotion. We get excited. We take risks. We trust somebody deeply. We take risks if they say it's going to be okay. And stewards of investment, how can we trust them? 
Smith is famous for theorizing something called the invisible hand of the market, which corrects imbalances and prevents colossal injustices because there's a certain, he says, commonly held interest in maintaining the system of the marketplace. But he was really interested in sympathy because of its potential to link people who didn't share a language, didn't share a culture, maybe even didn't share a religion. And in international markets, that's absolutely key. In America, the same worry was happening about democracy at this time, in the early days of the United States. So you get all the representatives of the different states together, right? And you want them to legislate the nation by debating with each other. But why would anybody in Massachusetts care about what's happening here in Kentucky, uh, much less think that it's worth a national effort or compromising in order to help out? Sympathy. The invisible link. But nobody had a lock on sympathy. What was it? Was it something you were born with? Or was it something that you had to learn? Did it cross various boundaries across human beings, racial boundaries, you know, where you were born? Did Native Americans have it? You know, did people who weren't Christians have it? These are the questions English people were asking themselves. It's, un it's unprovable what sympathy is, right? You can perform sympathy. Oh, Dan, I'm so sorry. I heard about that thing, you know? And I feel you can perform it, right? And so this made people suspicious. Others claimed that a sympathetic tear was undeniable proof of deep feeling. And we see that all the time in Charlotte Temple. Okay, the sentimental, because this is the main mode that this novel is written in. We might call the sentimental mode or the sentimental novel, this is the narrative or the poetic theorization of sympathy and its importance. By that I mean it's the way in which each novel thinks about and then makes an argument for how sympathy works. If that's one of the focuses of the novel, it's a sentimental novel. One of the signature sentimental works of the 18th century I told you about uh, was Goethe's The uh, Sorrows of Young Werther. Um, and that's a perfect example of the kind of book that is trying to, uh, it's trying to, to create, in effect, a formula for how sympathy works. Um, and in Charlotte Temple, once again, we also have a theorization of sympathy. And in fact, as we saw, George Temple, he gives up his class status as a result of it. He feels sorry for this veteran who's in jail, in a debtor's prison, he says I'm going to marry his daughter, I'm going to bail him out. His dad gets mad and kicks him out of the family, takes away his inheritance. Right? It's more important to George Temple to be able to feel right, to be able to connect with other human beings, than it is to have his inheritance. Um, as a side note, I just want to point out something about um, Montreville, our uh, supposed the bad guy in Charlotte Temple, uh, but one of the few people in the novel who actually changes over the course of it. Right, He starts out being impulsive, he's a seducer, he basically rapes Charlotte Temple. Uh, we don't see that scene happen, it's on the boat. I, I can see why we might not read it. Um, but then at the end, right, he's weeping over her grave and it says he's changed his mind, he's changed his whole life. Um, in in this, the next slide, slide number 16, Montreville had received a slight wound. Overcome with the agitation of his mind and loss of blood, he was carried in a state of insensibility to his distracted wife, who must have been thrilled by this scene. A dangerous illness and obstinate delirium ensued during which he raved incessantly for Charlotte. Awkward. But a strong constitution and the tender assiduities that his attentions of Julia, his wife, in time overcame the disorder. He recovered, but to the end of his life was subject to severe fits of melancholy. And while he remained at New York frequently, retired to the churchyard where he would weep over the grave and regret the untimely fate of the lovely Charlotte. It's a sure sign that the novel is bigger than just being a novel about a seducer. Melancholy is one of the key terms to describe a character's interior state or their mental state of feeling at this time. In the late um, 18th century, it in indicated a morbid state of reflection on impossible contradictions that also in uh, that often involved not being able to go back in time and fix things, right? You, you can't go back and recover something that you did wrong. A moment has passed, a moment that's idealized by a character, and it persists in provoking this almost paralytic, sometimes even kind of darkly enjoyable reflection and stasis. The paradox in Montreville's case is that melancholy, in fact, calms him down. It suppresses his foolish passion. It induces a kind of calmness. If he's sad, but he's calm. It ends his vacillating, his going back and forth between dangerous impulse and this kind of sensibleness of his affection. So I want to um, defend uh, my title, uh, Virtue Porn, and I want to suggest that in light of all of these definitions that we've been looking at, this book is considerably more complex than just the didactic fiction label would suggest. And I, um, I think it's doing more than just 
you know, I'll teach you how to be a sober matron, as it says. Um, if you look at the next slide, slide number 17, um, th this is the heart of the didactic part of the novel, right? The poor girl by thoughtless passion led astray, who, when she p parts with her honor, she f collapses socially, she collapses mentally, there's nobody to support her. It says later on, no benevolent hand to lead her back to the path of rectitude or, or rightness. She's disgraced her friends and so on. And the story here is that inevitably, if that happens, right, if, if, you, if you decide to have sex out of wedlock and you, you know, give in, Inevitably, shame bows her to the earth, it says. Remorse tears her distracted mind, and guilt, poverty, and disease close the dreadful scene. She sinks unnoticed to oblivion. It's not just that you'll be depressed. You'll die. That's the inevitable thing. I want to suggest that it's trying to train you to take your impulses that seem negative or that are demonized and to turn them into virtues, to turn them into good properties. Now, what I'm describing isn't necessarily something that Rosen intended when she wrote this book. I think it's a product of the contradictions between the things that she's setting in motion in this book, um, and by and large, it's also a product of disagreements within her culture about hand -to -hand, how to handle both novels and women and their, their powers. The challenge is, how do you make Charlotte both fallen and good at the same time? How do you keep her from becoming an evil person by falling away from her virtue? That's the task that she sets herself. On one level, this is clearly a protest novel. It expresses dissatisfaction that there is no legal or social remedy that uh, girls like Charlotte can, um, can appeal to. But I think on the other hand, it is also doing something innovative. A didactic novel is a bit at odds with certain common positions in its culture because it claims that women can be both fallen and good. In the process of making this argument, as I've suggested, Rosen heavily engages the concept of virtuous sympathy. But surely one of the reasons that people find the novel interesting is the suspense and the excitement of the love plot, right? Are they going to do it? You know, is she going to give in? We like that part. Uh, Belcour, the real bad guy, right? Is she going to give in to Belcour too? We, this is the suspense of the plot. That line about women loving a man in uniform, that's pretty bold for the time period. And the narrator even addresses the sober matrons, right, in, in a moment, admitting that the narrative is getting a little bit hot. So I want to focus on two scenes that bring together the virtuous objectives of this novel and excessive, almost sublime emotions into a kind of frenzy of sexual energy that is crucial to understanding the long-term appeal of sentimental novels. In other words, if Charlotte can be both fallen and good, the narrative flip side of that for us as readers is that being virtuous will make us sexy. I do not do this just to show how complex the genre can be, but also to make a methodological point. I want to say there are always tensions in novels like this, even when they seem really simple. There are tensions that reveal something about a culture, no matter how preachy it may be. There's something strange going on. So take a look at slide number 18. This is um, a quotation from the scene in which her parents are planning Charlotte's birthday party. I think, my dear, said Mrs. Temple, laying her hand on her husband's arm as they were walking together in the garden. I think next Wednesday is Charlotte's birthday, so she wants to plan something for her. Temple grabs her hand. Temple pressed his wife's hand in token of appreciation, and she proceeded. Tells him the plan. A very fine, fine plan indeed, said Temple, smiling. And you really suppose I will wink at your indulging the girl in this manner? You will quite spoil her, Lucy. Indeed you will. So a little bit of playful back and forth, right, in this scene. He's provoking her a little bit. It's, he's doing it virtuously. Uh, but she, and she knows he's doing it. So they're having a little, a little marital back and forth here. She's the only child we have, said Mrs. Temple. The whole tenderness of a mother adding animation to her fine countenance. That is to say, making her brighten up. Right? Making her a little bit blush, maybe. But it was withal tempered so sweetly with the meek affection and submissive duty of the wife, it's as if she knows, Rosen, when she's writing this, that when she talks about animation being added to her account, it's just a little bit sexy, and she's got to be like, no, no, cold water on that. It's just, it's meek affection. That, as she paused, expecting her husband's answer, he gazed at her tenderly. He's looking at her. He's like, hmm, 
You're looking pretty good this morning. And found he was unable to refuse her request. She is a good girl, said Temple. Next slide. She is indeed, replied the fond mother exultingly. Okay, now we're now our emotions are getting high. We're starting to exult. A grateful, affectionate girl. And I'm sure I will never lose sight of the duty she owns. She'll never lose sight of the duty she owes her parents, which she will in fact do in the next chapter. If she does, says he, she must forget the example set her by the best of mothers. They were talking about their daughter. Now he's like, oh, no, no. She, you're, you're the example of virtuous hotness. This puts her, this puts Charlotte's mom into a state of sublimity. Mrs. Temple could not reply. She struck, she struck wordless by this. But the delightful sensation that dilated her heart, well, we know what's dilating, sparked in her intelligent eyes and heightened the vermilion on her cheeks. And now she's blushing. And we know there are interesting things happen whenever anybody's blushing. And then we get this line, right? We've already got this kind of flirting going on between the two. Of all the pleasures of which the human mind is sensible. Okay, right now, you need to imagine all of the pleasures the human mind is sensible of, okay? I mean the really good ones, because what's coming is going to be better than that. There is none equal to that which warms and expands the bosom. Now we're talking about bosoms. When listening to commendations bestowed on us by a beloved object and are conscious of having deserved them. In other words, when you're being complimented by somebody that you love, it's better than sex. It's better than drugs. It's better than music. Did that for my brother. Nothing is better than music. Oh, that was predictable. That's not true. A lot of stuff is better than music. Okay, look at the next slide. Merciful heaven! Who would exchange the rapture of such a reflection for all the gaudy tinsel which the world calls pleasure? But to return, content dwelt in Mrs. Temple's bosom and spread a charming animation over her countenance. Her countenance just gets more and more animated every paragraph that goes by, as her husband led her in to lay the plan she had formed for the celebration of Charlotte's birthday before Mr. Eldridge. Flirting, virtuousness, they're all bound up here. It gets more astonishing. Remember the scene when Mrs. Beauchamp and her husband overhear Charlotte singing. And Mrs. Beauchamp is like, oh man, gosh, I feel sorry for her. I can tell she's pregnant, dude. She doesn't have a husband. This is bad. Okay, this scene. Tis poor Charlotte, said Mrs. Beauchamp, the pellucid drop of humanity stealing down her cheek. Right? She's crying. We know she's good. Captain Beauchamp was alarmed at her emotion. What, Charlotte, said he. Do you know her? In the accent of a pitying angel, did she disclose to her husband Charlotte's unhappy situation and the frequent wish that she had formed of being serviceable to her. I fear, continued she, the poor girl has been basely betrayed. And if I thought you would not blame me, I would pay her a visit, offer her my friendship, and endeavor to restore to her heart that peace she seems to have lost and so pathetically laments. This is a big ask, right? She's a fallen woman. Who knows, my dear? Next slide. Laying her hand affectionately on his arm. Now they're touching again, just like we saw in the last scene. We know what's going on. Who knows? But she has left some kind affectionate parent to lament her errors. And would she return, they might with rapture receive the poor penitent and wash away her faults in tears of joy. Oh, oh, okay. We're getting excited. What a glorious reflection would it be for me? Could I be the happy instrument of restoring her? Her heart may not be depraved, Beauchamp. Exalted woman. He's already into it cried Beauchamp, embracing her. Holy shit, what's going on? How dost thou rise every moment in my esteem? Mm -hmm. Follow the impulse of thy generous heart, my Emily. Let prudes and fools censure if they dare, almost looking you in the face, right? And saying, oh, you're judging me, really. Hmm. Well, look, look how sexy my virtue is. And blame a sensibility they never felt. See, if you're prudish, you don't feel the hotness that you need in order to be truly sympathetic with other human beings. That's the formula here. I will exulting. Holy shit, he's exulting again. He exulted once at the beginning of this paragraph, and now he's exulting again. And guess what? It's going to happen one more time before this is all over. I will exultingly tell them that the heart that is truly virtuous is ever inclined to pity and forgive the errors of its fellow creatures. And then the next slide. A beam of, that's right, exulting joy played around the animated countenance of Mrs. Beauchamp. Now she's exulting, he's exulting. It's just a perfect world. We're all exulting. And that's how it ought to be, yo, I'm just saying. At these encomiums bestowed on her by a beloved husband, the most delightful sensations. Remember, the most delightful sensations mm -hmm. pervaded her heart. And because this is what you do after you've had a mutual exulting episode, having breakfasted, she prepared to visit Charlotte. What? Why are you looking at me like that? At least he gave her breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There's not an actual sex scene here, but the point is that what is happening here is we're being asked to think that virtue can be as absorbing and as pleasurable as 
sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's not true. Okay, dude, you can doubt it, but there's no doubt that it's going on in here. So it's not just about preaching that you need to obey your parents. You actually need to weirdly, somehow, become sexily virtuous. I am. The last slide, I just want to close. This is because we always have to close with death. Less death. Not gonna happen. None of these novels have happy endings. Sorry, spoiler. Here's the thing. This is a tale of truth, which is fictional. Okay, fair enough. But people took this story very, very seriously. This alchemy about virtue, about sex and seduction, um, about what people took to be the unfair death of Charlotte, and the conversion of Montreville at the end, that he eventually, as a dude, somehow comes to realize, oh, my passions took over and that was wrong. That was a potent mix for people at the time. Not only was Charlotte's grave, wait a minute, Charlotte wasn't a real person, but as you see, there it is, the grave of Charlotte Temple, and you can visit it today in New York City at Trinity Church, right in the middle of town. I should you not, dude, you're making that face, but no lie, there it is. There was also, at the time, a traveling wax figure show with characters from this novel. That scene by her graveside with Montreville crying and melancholy induced serious fan imitations all over the place. So a few years ago, they went into the Trinity Churchyard and they dug up this grave, right? Because I guess people thought, well, maybe there might be an actual body even though Charlotte Temple is a completely fictional character. Yeah, there was no body in there. Um, but look, Charlotte was never real. But my point is, for many people, she represented truth. Next time, we're reading this novel, Hobomock, by Lydia Maria Child. Your book will not look like this. This book is really, really old. I hope you enjoy it. We're gonna be switching modes and tackling the historical novel. And we're gonna be going back in time to the very earliest days of American settlement in the North. We're gonna be there with the pilgrims and we're gonna be there with the indigenous people who they were partly trying to get along with and partly trying to get rid of. And this novel is uh, I'm not going to lie. It's a bit of a trial at first. It's a little bit of slow going. And I apologize for that because there's a lot of Puritan theology in it and there's just no way to get past it. But the last 15 pages are absolutely unforgettable. That's the best that I can do. What? Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> that is a pretty hard sell, man. Thank you for your attention, people. I'm done. Action.